is the title of our message, taken from Judges chapter 11, verse 29 to 40. And Jephthah vowed a vow unto the Lord, and said, If thou shalt without fail deliver the children of Ammon into my hands, then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the children of Ammon shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. And Jephthah came to Mizpah unto his house, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with timbrels and with dances, and she was his only child. Beside her he had neither son nor daughter, and it came to pass when he saw her that he rent his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, I thought thou hast brought me thou hast brought me very low, and thou art one of them that trouble me, for I have opened my mouth unto the Lord, and I cannot go back. And it came to pass at the end of two months that she returned unto her father, who did with her according to his vow, which she had vowed, and she knew no man. And there was a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went yearly to lament the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite, four days in a year. Amen. The name Jephthah means he openeth, he does open or set free. Judges 11 verse 1 tells us that Jephthah was a mighty man of valor. He was a son of a harlot, and Gilead beget Jephthah, our text tells us. It's the first time the name a mighty man of valor was used was on Gideon, the character that we have been studying over the last two to three weeks. A man of courage, boldness and bravery. A spirit-filled man. Here, the terminology is not used just in a military nature, but refer to a person of repute, one that has standing in the community, a responsible person. In this context, it is likely his reputation was built upon his military success. In verse 2, it says, And Gilead's wife bare him sons, and his wife's sons grew, and they trust out Jephthah, and said unto him, Thou shalt not inherit in our father's house, for thou art the son of a strange woman. Jephthah was an outcast, an illegitimate son, driven from his father's household. The son of a harlot, it should be noted, that it was not any family shame or humiliation that resulted in Jephthah being driven out of his home. There, during the time of the judges, there were in existence temple prostitutes and polygamy, uh, multiple, a man having multiple marriages, multiple wives, and therefore it's fairly common for have, to have different children of mothers in the same household. And here our text makes it clear that it was an inheritance motivated, or it was the inheritance that motivated his being driven out of the house. For thou art the son of a strange woman. So, whether Jephthah was firstborn, had rights to a double portion, or whether they were dividing it equally, the elimination of one party does increase the share of the others. He's a Gileadite, and so we take note that it was from the land of Gilead. And you'll see it in the map that is given there in your notes. And <clears throat> our text tells us he was driven out of his house and he went to the place called Top, the land of Top, verse 3. 
Then Jephthah fled from his brethren and dwelt in the land of Top, and there gathered vain men to Jephthah and went out with him, and it came to pass in the process of time then that the Ammonites made war with Israel. So then came war. The Ammonites uh, invaded the land. And uh, you would be able to see uh, that in the, in the map that is given to you there. And verse 5, And it was so that when the children of Ammon made war against Israel, the elders of Gilead went forth to fetch Jephthah out of the land of Top, and said unto Jephthah, Come and be our captain, that we may fight with the children of Ammon. Jephthah enlisted the elders of Gilead to was enlisted by the elders of Gilead to defend Israel against the oppression of the Ammonites. And Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, Did not ye hate me and expel me out of my father's house? And why are ye come unto me now when ye are in distress? And the elders of Gilead said unto Jephthah, Therefore we turn again to thee now, that thou mayest go with us and fight against the children of Ammon and be our head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. And Jephthah said unto the elders of Gilead, If ye bring me home again to fight against the children of Ammon, and the Lord delivered them before me, shall I be your head? And the elders of Gilead said unto Jephthah, The Lord be witness between us, if we do not so according to thy words. Then Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and captain over them. And Jephthah uttered all his words before the Lord in Mispay. So you see here that uh, Jephthah was a man who was made the leader of Israel's army. And in Hebrews 11 verse 32 is recorded of what Jephthah did. It was an act of faith. What shall I say more? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, of Barak, of Samson, of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets. So he was probably a, the leader of a renegade band of courageous men who proved his worth as a military leader. And his reputation in top was known to the people in Gilead. And therefore, the position was offered by the elders to him to set up as a, the military governor of Gilead. Verse 12. And Gilead sent messengers unto the king of Ammon, saying, Why hast thou, What hast thou to do with me? And thou art come against me to fight in the land. And the king of Ammon answered the messengers of Jephthah, Because Israel took away my land. And they came out of Egypt from Arnon, even unto Jabbok, and unto Jordan. Now therefore restore those lands again peaceably. So he was negotiating in a territorial dispute. He first tried to negotiate a peaceful settlement with the king of Ammon concerning the ownership of the land. Uh, they went back to history. Jephthah stated his claims for Israel, and uh, the Ammonites also stated their claims um, concerning their uh, rights to the land. And so the story goes that uh, before Jephthah would uh, go out and fight the war, they didn't they were not able to peacefully negotiate a settlement, so there was a need uh, to settle it in the battlefield. And we see in our text, which we read, how Jephthah made a vow. Uh, he was a mighty man of valor. The Spirit of the Lord descended upon him. But in all his sincerity, he made a rash vow. And here... <clears throat> the Word of God tells us concerning what is a vow. A vow is a solemn promise to God and, or a thing that is 
promised. And so there are specific words given in a vow, and we see in the Bible the instance of Jacob vowing a vow to God in Genesis 28 verse 20. If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me to eat and raiment, well, he says that he vowed a vow to the Lord that he will repay a tenth. And in Genesis 31, 13, I am the God of battle, which thou anointest the pillar and thou, where thou vowest a vow unto me. So God, God heard his vow. And God came back and reminded him of his vow. So vows that we make before God, uh, God hears, God hears. And uh, then there is a vow made in uh, Numbers 21 concerning the king Arad of, from the Canaanite camp who dwelt in the south. And there uh, Israel vowed a vow that if thou would indeed deliver this people unto my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. And the Lord hearkened to the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites and they destroyed them and their cities. And he called the name of the place Hormah. So here the people went to the Lord and said, Lord, if you would deliver us, the people. We were, as what you have said to us, not to be associated with them in any way. If you give us the victory, we will utterly destroy these cities. That was the vow that Israel made in their conquest and they fulfilled it. And then there's this third instance that we see Jephthah, which we are uh, which we are focusing on now. In the Mosaic Law, the Lord's teaching concerning vows, Numbers 30 verse 2, if a man vow a vow unto the Lord, or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceedeth out of his mouth. Numbers 30 verse 3 to 5, if a woman also vow a vow unto the Lord and bind herself by a bond, being in her father's house in her youth, her father hear her vow and her bond, wherewith she hath bound her, her soul, and her father hath hold his peace at her, then all her vows shall stand. Every bond wheresoever she hath bound her soul shall stand. But if her father disallowed her, in other words, the daughter is not married. And if she were to vow a vow in the sight of the father and the father heard it and the father said no, then the Lord will not go after her. If the father said no because she's of the household. The father said no, then that vow is disannulled. Disannulled. Okay? The same with the wife. The husband has the... Uh, is given uh, the, uh, the prerogative from God to disannul the wife's vow. But if a husband disallowed her on the day he heard it, then he shall make her vow which she, he shall, then he shall make her vow which she vowed, and that which she uttered with her lips, wherewith she bound her soul of none effect, the Lord shall forgive her. And then there is the vow of a widow. The vow of the widow is binding. Or that is, that is divorced, wherewith they have bound their soul shall stand against her. And her husband heard it and held his peace at her and disallowed her not. Then all her vows shall stand and every bond wherewith she bound her soul shall stand. But if the husband had utterly made them void unto the day he heard them, then whatsoever proceeded out of her lips concerning her vows, concerning the bond of her soul, shall not stand. Her husband hath made them void, and the Lord shall forgive her. Every vow and every binding oath to afflict the soul, her husband may establish it or her husband may make it void. 
But if the husband altogether hold his peace at her from day to day, then he establish all her vows, all her bonds, all her bonds which are upon her, he confirmeth them because he held his peace in the day, at her in the day that he heard them. But if he shall in any way make them void after he had heard them, then he shall bear she <coughs> he shall bear her iniquity. Once made a vow had to be paid by the one who made it. For if she, he or she did not pay, she was cons- it is considered a sin. Deuteronomy 23, verse 21 to 23, says here, When thou shalt vow a vow unto the Lord thy God, thou shalt not be slack to pay it. For the Lord thy God will surely require it of thee, and it would be sin in thee. But if thou shalt forbear to vow, it shall be no sin in thee, that which is gone out of thy lips, thou shalt keep and perform, even a free will offering, according as thou hast vowed unto the Lord thy God, which thou hast promised with thy mouth. Proverbs twenty verse twenty five warned against making a vow before carefully considering the wisdom of doing so. It is a snare to the man who devoureth that which is holy and after vows to make inquiry. Jephthah made a rash vow without considering the implications and suffered greatly for it. Jephthah's vow was a rash one. It was callous, heedless, and it's interesting, immediately after the record of the filling of the Holy Spirit upon Jephthah, that he had a vow that he would later live to regret. You realize how a man can fall at the epitome of his strength. On the one hand, you may be there, but there the temptation came, and a man can fall. So here you see how uh, subtle it is, uh, the temptation. What made him vow such a ridiculous vow without due consideration of the consequence of his vow. It was careless, it was heedless. God fulfilled his part of the vow. Jephthah had to fulfill his. This was an excellent, or there is an excellent definition that is given in the Zondervan Pictorial Encyclopedia of the Bible. It says, the vow is a pledge or both of a religious character and a transaction between God and men in which man dedicates himself or his service or something valuable to God. Jephthah vowed as a sacrifice to God whatever first should first meet him on his return if God would grant him victory over the Ammonites who in grief offered his only child who so met him. Would the Lord have granted Israel victory even if Jephthah had not vowed? Deuteronomy 32 verse 22 says, If thou shalt forbear to vow, it shall be no sin. In this case, Jephthah made the vow, therefore he had to pay the vow. It was a rash vow. He vowed a vow to be fulfilled if the Lord would deliver the Ammonites to him. And as a thanksgiving to God, he said he would offer whatever that came out of his house at the return of his battle. Not just a rash vow, but a redundant vow. Jephthah makes this vow as if he needed it to secure victory. Although God's Spirit had already come upon him for the battle with Amnon, uh, he did make such a vow. The one who had been so calculating in his self-interest ended up destroying that which he counted most dear, his only child. There are dire consequences to the vows that we make. Jephthah defeated the Ammonites and on his return, his daughter and only child came out to meet him. He told her of his vow and declared he could not go back upon his word. The daughter begged for two months' respite in order to go away and bewail her virginity. On her return, her father fulfilled the vow. Jephthah's vow cost him dearly the life of his daughter. In those twilight, uncivilized times, 
There was the practice of sacrifice of human beings at times of special stress. Judges 11 verse 40. That the daughters of Israel went yearly to lament the daughter of Jephthah, the Gilead, four days a year. A time was specially set aside by the women of Israel to remember the sad plight of this innocent girl, victim of her father's rash vow. May we learn this lesson that we be very careful in making vows. We are to consider carefully if we are able to pay the vow that we vow. May we not be rash in committing ourselves. What are the vows that we make for the modern day Christian? Well, one good example is the marriage vow. And here I have for a couple <clears throat> uh, to make that will make the marriage vow in the sight of God and men, the pledge. Would thou have this woman to be thy wedded wife, to live together after God's ordinance in holy matrimony? Would thou love her, comfort her, honour her, and keep her in sickness and in health, forsaking all other, keep thee only unto her, so long as thou shalt live? Would thou have this man to thy wedded husband, to live together after God's ordinance in the holy estate of matrimony, would thou obey him and serve him and love, honour and keep him in sickness and in health, forsaking all other, keep thee only unto him so long as ye both shall live. The marriage vow, a binding vow, and the vow that was taken, I take thee to be my wedded wife, to have and to hold from this day forward for better or for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness or in health, to love and to cherish till death do us part, according to God's holy ordinance. Thereto I pledge you my word. And I take thee, the wife would say, to be my wedded husband, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love, to cherish, to obey, till death do us part, according to God's holy ordinance. Thereto I pledge you my word. And then there is the exchange of rings. With this ring I thee wet, with my body I thee honour, and with my worldly goods I thee endow, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. You see, it's a binding vow uh, said in the sight of the triune God. The marriage vow is a lifetime consecration between a man and a woman till death do us part. This is a solemn promise before God. Hence, it behooves us to consider carefully before committing ourselves to marriage. The Bible says in Proverbs 18, verse 22, Whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good thing, and obtaineth, fa obtaineth favour of the Lord. Proverbs 31, verse 10, Who can be, find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. Marriage is the oldest institution in the world, and God intended it to be a happy one. At the point of decision, a couple is at the door of heaven or at the gates of hell. The new life they are entering can be a life of sublime happiness, but it may be a life of sheer boredom and misery. A Christian lady testified. I remember my mother saying before Bill and I were married, be sure you loved him. Be sure you loved him. It is hard enough for a for to live with a man you love, living with, in, with one you do not love, would be hell on earth. Next to our conversion, marriage is probably the most important step that we will ever take. But to look around and see the miserable, the misery and the unhappiness in so many homes makes us realise how frivolous so many girls are when it comes to marriage. Many fail to consider the seriousness of it and plunge into, into it carelessly and heedlessly. 
And he says, I realize many a girl, fearing she might be an old maid, carries the first fella who comes along to save herself from this predicament, only to live in regret the rest of her life. Others living in an unhappy home caused by fussing or perhaps poverty feel they can marry and get away from this. But they find instead of stepping into a life of sublime happiness, they have only jumped from the frying pan into the fire. Marriage is in itself does not make happiness. Just because you are a good Christian doesn't mean you will leave you will have a happy marriage. Not even if the man you marry is a good Christian. And just as your parents are happily married does not guarantee your marriage will be happy. Happiness in marriage is something that must be worked for in order to be achieved. It is something that must be earned. How much better it would be in the Lord. Marriage is so important. It should never be misused or abused, yet of all institutions, it seems to be the most misunderstood. It is adapted from the right romance in marriage by Kathy Rice. This book was, well, was given whilst preparing for my own marriage. Here is a testimony of Rosalind Goforth, the wife of the misery, missionary to China, Jonathan Goforth. Many details in this record can be better understood after knowing something of the author, who for 49 years was Jonathan Goforth's closest companion and the mother of 11 children. This was her testimony. I was born near Kensington Gardens, London, England, on the 6th of May, 1864, coming to Montreal, Canada, with my parents three years later. From my earliest childhood, much time was spent beside the ease of my artist father, who thought that I should be an artist. My education, apart from art, was received chiefly in private schools or my own, from my own mother. In May, 1885, I graduated from the Toronto School of Art and began preparation to leave in the autumn for London to complete my art studies. When I was 12 years old, I heard Mr. Alfred Santum speak on John 3.16 at a revival meeting. As he fervently presented the love of God, I yielded myself absolutely to the Lord Jesus and stood up among others, publicly confessing Him as my Master. On the way home from the meeting, I was told again and again how foolish it was for me to think I could be sure Christ had received me. So early the next morning, I got my Bible and turning the pages over and over, I prayed that I might get some word which would assure me Christ has really received me. At the last, I came to John 6, 27. Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Then I was told I was too young to be received, and again I went to my Bible. I came, after searching a long time, to these words, Proverbs 8, verse 17, Those that seek me early shall find me. I, will never, I have never doubted since then that I was the Lord's child. When I was 19 years old, I began to pray that if the Lord wanted me to marry, He would lead me to one wholly given up to him and to his service. I wanted no other. On Sunday in June of that year, a stranger took the place of our Bible class teacher. He was introduced to me, the organist, as Mr. Henry O'Brien. Three days later, two large parties were crossing the lake on the same boat, one an artist picnic bound for the Nagara Falls and the other bound for the Nagara on the Lake the Bible Conference. That evening, both groups returned on the same boat. I was sitting in the artist circle beside my brother when Mr. O'Brien touched me and said, Why, you are my organist on Sunday last. 
you are the very one I want to join us. I want to join us in the mission next Saturday. We are to leave a workers' meeting and tea. I would like you to meet them all. I was on the point of saying this was impossible when my mother or when my brother whispered, "You have no time. You are going to England, partly to show him I could do as I pleased." And I said to O'Brien, "Well, expect me on Saturday." As O'Brien turned to leave, he called to a shabby fellow, whom he introduced as Jonathan Goforth, our city missionary. You know, he was the one who sang, uh, "Lord, crucified, Lord, crucified, give me a heart like thine. Teach me to love the dying souls of men." Lord, give to me a heart so close to Thee. Lord, give me love, pure Calvary's love, to bring the lost to Thee. That was Jonathan Goforth, and so here he said, "I forgot the shabbiness of his clothes, however, for the wonderful challenge in his eyes." The following Saturday, found me in a large square workers' room. Of the Toronto Mission Union, just as the meeting was about to begin, Jonathan Goforth was caught out of the room. As he rose, he placed his Bible on the chair. Something happened, then which I could not never explain nor try to excuse. Suddenly, I stepped past four or five people, took up his Bible, and returned to my seat. Rapidly, I turned the leaves and found the book worn almost to shreds in parts. And marked from cover to cover, I quickly returned it to the chair, and returning to my seat, I tried to look very innocent. As I sat there, I said to myself, "That is the man that I would like to marry." That very day, I've chosen, as I was chosen as one of a committee with Jonathan Goforth, to open a mission, mission new mission. In the weeks that followed, I had great many opportunities. To glimpse his inner greatness. So when in that autumn he asked, "Will you join your life with mine for China?" My answer was yes. It was during the time of the Boxer Rebellion. They had children. Uh, there was a book that was uh, recorded by uh, the Reverend Timothy To uh, concerning the Boxer Rebellion in China, how he was there with his family, and it was. How he was,、uh, the family was saved. God protected them、uh, during those difficult times. <clears throat> so here, she answered yes without a moment's hesitate, hesitation. But a few days later, he said, "Will you give me your promise that you will always allow me to put my Lord and His work first, even before you?" Well. This was the story uh, concerning uh, the marriage that took place.、Um, here we may learn from the lesson of Jephthah on the matter of vows that we may not make rash, careless, heedless vows that we live to regret for a lifetime. Such is the gravity of the matter. May we therefore consider carefully before we make a vow. May the Lord help us through much prayer and waiting upon the Lord. Be assured that it is God's will for us before we commit ourselves. That was the、uh, that is the the story of Jephthah and his vow.、Uh, how important it is that we learn、uh, from God's word so that we would be able. To make、uh, godly, sound decisions、uh, according to godly principles, so that when we would engage ourselves in a matter, we know that we have the peace of God, we have the Word of God with us to guide us, and that the matter that we have committed to the Lord,、uh, you see,、uh, would last a lifetime. The blessing of God, 
when we know that we are walking in the centre of His will. So may the Lord help us and guide us so that we may uh, walk with Him, we may take time to meditate upon His Word, to know Him, so that our steps will be firm and sure ones, receiving the blessing of God. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank Thee for Thy Word. Strengthen us by Thy Spirit to enable us to understand Thy holy will. This I pray with thanksgiving through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.